My guest today is Jesus McDonald. Jesus is one of the very first people I ever met on LinkedIn about two years ago. And he sort of taught me the ropes on how to really uh, do business on LinkedIn. And so he is the CEO and founder of JRM Web Marketing. It's, it, it's a WordPress website development agency for B2B SaaS companies. So he spent a lot of time first in the marketing world and he knew what he didn't want in his own agency. He wanted to help the frustrated people who couldn't reach their account manager, web designer, or web developer. And in total transparency, Jesus was one of my clients. I have written and worked with him on his own website. And one of the key differentiators for uh, JRM Web Marketing is all of his team is in the United States. So there's not that time zone difference when you're trying to get a hold of somebody in an emergency, if your website goes down or what have you. So that's where he really created his whole website solution basis. So he vowed to create the unique agency model focused on only one service, website solutions, and that's it. So today we're going to talk about website strategy. And I also give some of my opinion on, since we have worked together on some of these projects that he's on, both from a developer and, and a designer's point of view, as well as from a copywriter's perspective. Let's jump right in. Hey, Jesus, I'm so excited to talk to you. It's been a while. I had you on as one of my very first guests like a year and a half ago, and a lot has changed. <laughs> so it's great to get an update on what's going on with websites and website strategy and design. And so thank you for taking the time. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks for so, reaching out and... Pleasures all mine. Yeah. So let's jump into huge question. All right. What is your website strategy? So my website strategy is a little different than what people consider a website strategy. Uh, me being a marketer as a website guy, I think about more about where all the marketing efforts are going. And then anything that comes back to the website, I see it as website conversions. So the website conversions tell me that your marketing efforts are working. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the website strategy, I think about, okay, pricing. Basically, all the advice that I give to SaaS companies, display pricing, make it as frictionless as possible mm -hmm. um, to where it's easy for them to get in contact with us, get in contact with you if we're talking about your website. The same thing when it comes to uh, the product or services, uh, is that easy to find? Uh, is navigation easy? Um, user experience? Those things are very, very important. Um, and ultimately, the speed of your website. If it takes me 10 seconds or, or more, which is ridiculous to load your homepage or any other pages, I'm leaving. Like, right. you lost a buyer. Right. So my website strategy is is thinking that they're coming from a different, I call it channel or mm -hmm. platform. So they're coming from, for us, they come from LinkedIn inbound or a podcast. So if they're coming from there, the website strategy, even the copy is more geared, I would say majority of it towards people that already know us, that have already built trust with me and my content on LinkedIn. Uh, and then we also working with you with our website copy, we've also made sure that we not only did it to that, to those types of people, but also to the people that are finding us through Google search mm -hmm. or through a referral. Um, they're able to come to our website, never heard of us, doesn't have the trust already built. Who the heck is Asus? You know, he's the CEO of the company, but who is he? What does he like? You know, <laughs> who right. am I going to work with? Who's going to handle my account? So that's in a nutshell what website strategy is for me is geared more towards people that have already heard about me or the business mm -hmm. from social media through podcasting and come to our website that right. way. Do most people have an idea like what they want? Like, do they come to you with like, Hey, I saw this website and I really like the look of it. Can you do that kind of thing? Or do they leave it up to you? Uh, both. Mm -hmm. Two days ago, I had a guy reach out to me and we're going back and forth in the LinkedIn DMs. And he said, hey, 
I visited your website. It looks very clean. Would like to see other samples that you have Mm -hmm. that are similar. I've had people that reach out to me and say they already have like the inspiration work sample that they really want. And they tell us for work samples and if we're we're capable of doing it. So I've had both both sides. Mm -hmm. Because I find like copy and content is supposed to be copy determines and content determines your design, correct? Is that what you agree with that? I agree with that. I think website companies like to, I'm, I'm being very general here, but they like to have control. So if they have a template that they've used so many times uh, for so many customers, they like to keep things within the template. They might even say, hey, we do copy mm-hmm. as part of our services because we're an all-inclusive agency and they'll write the copy for them. Mm-hmm. We don't do any type of copy. We leave that to the experts. Mm-hmm. We do websites, so we know how to design, we know how to develop, and we know how to maintain them. But we're not saying, hey, we're, co- we're experienced conversion copywriters. Right. We don't do that. We work with, with conversion copywriters like you mm-hmm. and to help us come up with the copy. But ultimately, the reason why I went to WordPress is because the creativity level. The sky's the limit on creativity. When I think if I have a template and I tell you, provide me the copy within these parameters, I'm limiting your creativity. Mm -hmm. And I'm also limiting potential sales for the client. So I rather you understand how many section blocks there are on a page for the design layout and give you more of a range like, Hey, there's going to be three to like six section blocks around Mm -hmm. there. That's usually a good range, but I would want you to provide me the copy because you've done the research. You talked to their customers. You've done all of that stuff, right? You know, the voice of the customer, the value prop, all those things. And then you give me, for example, the homepage copy and Mm -hmm. we do the design layout. Right. According to the copy. Because that's what's best for the customer. Yeah. Because I, I'm i sort of, I don't know if, how other copywriters do it, um, but I like to use a wireframe as I'm writing the copy to kind of visualize. I'm just such a visual person. I have a hard time just writing mm-hmm. the copy. Like I'll have an idea about how it's going to shape up, but I, I think it's important to kind of have a back and forth between like there's a lot of sites, for example, that are very minimal now. Is that still a trend with copy and with design? Minimal. So a lot of white space. Yeah. And that makes it harder because that copy has got to pack a punch. I mean, you need to really, every oh, yeah. word is more important because no one's reading through anything. I just heard the other day that, in fact, yesterday on the news, there's some new AI product that will summarize a website for you. And my first thought was, all that effort that I'll be putting into writing the copy, (laughs) you know, and and someone's just going to plug this AI thing that they said they're going to just pull out the information that you need. But on on the other hand, I write for what we call the different types of decision makers. How do people go through your website? And most people are skimmers. They're going to jump to headline to headline. They like what they see. They'll read the subheadline, you know, and subheadings and what we call crossheads. And then Mm -hmm. they may read in more detail, especially with what you do. They really want to know, well, what's the process of, you know, the web design. So Mm -hmm. they're going to, but they're not doing that right off the bat. You know, they, they're not going to read it. They're going to jump around. So, yeah. Um, But how do you know that? You have to be very concise. Yeah. And you mentioned um, pricing pages. Now I know you're working on changing a pricing page. What made you decide to change it and what kind of changes are you making to it? Yeah. So for the pricing page, why I thought I've been thinking about changing our pricing page is because we have a maintenance plans. We have maintenance plans and then we have, you know, website development retainers. And when it comes to the maintenance plans, we do two service requests per month for the, for the pro plan, for example, and whoever's listening to this, don't 
you don't have to remember all the plants, just FYI. <laughs> but for each plant, there is a set number of service requests. And a service request is changing the blog, uh, posting a new blog, swapping images, embedding videos, um, very basic type maintenance things that are done on the front end. Yeah. Uh, but what I've been noticing a lot from discovery calls and also working with customers directly is that they still get confused. They still need reminders of what the maintenance items are. Mm -hmm. And we have it more where it's uh, any unused service request don't roll over to the next month. Mm -hmm. So it's use it or lose it. Right. And some people understand it. They get it. You know, we're not, they're like, cool. You're not like back in the day, AT&T rollover minutes. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> we get it. Things change, right? Um, and you dedicate a certain number of hours to help us out with that. The other part is people don't like that, especially if they're not being used. Like, why should we get charged for that? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, we're pretty lenient where I know I'm kind of like, crossing boundaries here by, by actually helping them out, you know, if they haven't used them for months, but I've wanted to avoid confusion. So what I'm thinking that we're going to be doing is removing all service requests for the front end and just having them as web dev hours or web design hours. Mm -hmm. So we're only focusing on having one maintenance plan, which only handles the back end maintenance, the plugin, theme updates, security layers, hosting, all that stuff, right? Backups, you name it. And that's at a set monthly price. Mm -hmm. And if you need more than back end, then you pay for, you know, a website retainer that involves development hours. Could, could be a set number of hours per month on top of the maintenance plan. So that's something you're still working on, it sounds like. That is something that is on my to-do list for the end of this month. And uh, yeah, I'm going to, once I figure that out in regards to the packages uh, for the set number of hours, I'm thinking about doing like maybe 10, 25 and 40 hours per month. And then, yeah. then I might be ready with that. And I might even reach out to you um, to help me with the wording. Cause I don't, I don't know how much of the copy is going to change. I do know that the, the plans are going to change, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the copy is going to change at some point. So I am going to reach out to you. Cool. Yeah. The rollover plans on anything, and I've used it through different businesses. It gets so confusing because the end of the month, people are like, well, I didn't right. use this. And so you roll it over and then you know, you don't, and every month becomes like this, it just gets worse and worse. And I've done that with this business mm -hmm. with, you know, when I had my fitness business and people buy certain hours with me and totally, it was just, and I think going, going with the paying for a block of hours every month is less confusing. Um, but people understand like, okay, with the service requests, the turnaround time could be anywhere between three business days and seven business days with the, buying a block of web development hours that could be same day to the next business day mm -hmm. in regards to getting a developer or two on your task and projects. Mm -hmm. So it basically reserves that time for the client. Right. And instead of waiting in line, you're moved up to the top of the line. Yeah. So that was also another big benefit to doing the retainers yeah and getting rid of the service requests mm -hmm. nobody wants slow everyone wants efficiency these days so <laughs> i know and yeah and that's the thing is that companies are all competing with that as well so makes it hard mm -hmm. uh, how do you even know if your marketing efforts are working with with a website yeah so i touched a little bit about this at the beginning um maybe I jumped the gun here <laughs> is the website conversions. Yeah. It goes back to website conversions. I feel like that's a strong indicator that or a strong signal that your marketing efforts are working. Mm -hmm. I know for me personally, we do 100% inbound leads from LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. So we do no paid ads or anything like that. So when I see 
people reaching out to my LinkedIn profile and DMing me, leaving comments about, hey, we need to talk. I got a project. We should chat soon. Or they come to the website and they fill out the, you know, the form, meaning they book a time on my calendar and we jump on a video call, Zoom, Google Meet, whatever it is. That's when I know it's working specifically. Because mm-hmm. um, if it's not, then we wouldn't have the conversions from the website. Right. And I think that's for everyone. You know, are people booking time on the calendar? Yeah. Filling out the form. Are they? And if they're not, then what needs to change? How do you, do you use like a, what do they call it? Heat maps. Like on my own site, I have Hotjar. Do you use uh, software like that to track where people are or what they're clicking? I personally don't for my website, uh, but we do for clients. Mm-hmm. Cause I find that very weird. Like I, I look at mine to see, cause you want to see where people are getting stuck and, there's something I only heard recently called rage clicking, <laughs> which I think is hysterical. Have you heard of this? But people no. can't find, but they can't, it's, it's a term. Oh, they're just, they're just going through a ton of things and scrolling. Yeah. They're trying to find something you can tell. And I, I mentioned this to a client who has the, um, I don't know if it was hot jar, but some kind of tracking device. We were talking about this and he was familiar with it. He goes, oh yeah, I know it's a SaaS company. He says, yeah, if they're going back and forth, he said, you see, because you can see the mouse going all mm. over the place. He says, they're looking for something and they're not finding it. Or they're clicking on something that's not working or it's not what they want. And you can sort of see, and I do that with my own site. I'll see where people are going. And mm-hmm. people are crazy with that mouse. I mean, it goes all over. And I'm like, do I do that when I go to the website? <laughs> but you can see if they're getting stuck or hung up. Because literally a button on a website is the literal conversion point. Like if they click mm-hmm. on something, they, you totally. know. Yeah. And we see that as like a, an open door. Like they don't know what's behind that door or they, they but they should. And they should have an idea, but they're taking they a should, chance. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So are, are you clear with, you know, even for me, you know, the little, we call it micro copy, which would be button copy. Do they know what they're clicking on? Because if they click on it mm. and, you know, in some cases it takes to a sales page not ready for, you know, they get upset with it. And, oh yeah. And that just, destroys the trust. Yeah. And they just jump off of the page, you know, I'm curious, what has been the most, what are your top pages? When it well, comes the home to the page is jar? always the number one, number one. That sure. when I, yeah. Cause all my clients, they'll send me the SEO or, you know, the, I'll see where mm-hmm. people are landing. It's almost always a home page. Um, in fact, pretty much every time, unless it's a, if they have an ad for a particular product where there's a landing page that connects to it, obviously they jump on that. But the home page, right. the about page is still super popular. Do you find that as well? Like the Yeah, for us, it's home number one, obviously. And then I would say it's about pricing yeah. and contact us. The transparency with pricing with SaaS companies, is that kind of new? Because you hear about it on LinkedIn a lot and more and more people are doing it. Is that? I think it's an ongoing thing. I don't think it's new. I think people still don't put pricing on their website. I just tried talking about it so much to where I'm reposting things on LinkedIn about transparent pricing because that's one of the best ways to like just get more demos, just get more bookings is to put pricing on there. Because mm-hmm. if I'm being educated on LinkedIn, for example, and the need is there, I'm ready to buy. So when I go to your website, I want to look for pricing. I want to look to talk to somebody that can con- that I can consult with if I need someone to consult me with. Right. Like I want to, I want it to be as easy as possible and without pricing, I'm more hesitant and I'd rather go with somebody else like a competitor. Right. Because I don't know what I'm paying for and I don't know if if I should, yeah, if I should move forward with it. If it's The a- more information, the better. Mm-hmm. I think people are, people who, you know, like business owners are afraid of it because they're saying, well, people, you know, they might get turned off. Well, then they're not your customer then. If it's not in yeah. their price range, then you're better off knowing that before you get on a call and you go through, you know, everything about what you do. And 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 I think too, people are getting very savvy. They know that 
you know, are smart. And, yeah, they know the marketing yeah. strategies. It's like, well, before I tell yeah. you the price, let me tell you what the benefits are. They know about that, but still you're going to get all the way down to the finish line and then you tell the price and it's way out of what they were expecting. And you just wasted all that time. You wasted all that time. And I, I've, yeah, I've talked to founders and they're like, well, it's complicated. It's very complicated. And because it depends, it depends. And then they break down all why it depends and everything like that. And I'm like, I would never sit on a demo for this. Um, even if the need was there, like that's just too much. And mm -hmm. if we, you find out at the end that we're not a good fit, I'd rather have that up front. Right. Right. Somebody reached out to me, industry partner, said, Hey, I have a referral for you. Um, they said that they want to do a redesign for 6K. And I said, Our redesign started at 20K. It's not going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. She said, Great. Thank you. I was looking elsewhere. I just saved that client or her client a lot of time. Right. Because we're no longer in that consideration for options when it comes to a redesign. Yeah. And that's fine. Some, somebody can do that. And somebody, that might be someone's ICP, ideal customer persona. That might be someone's ideal client right there. Mm -hmm. But I think the more, the more you're confident and the more you're putting out your pricing, the more you're able to get more quality leads right. that can convert to customers. And that's what you ultimately want. Because pricing too low, I I'm suspicious of it, you know. And but then it's like all the right, time. I'm, yeah, I'm shopping like <laughs> on a personal. I'm shopping for dinnerware, and so I'm looking at a site called Maiden is the name of the company. Everything mm -hmm. is super pricey, and I'm looking at it's so elegant. But I'm like, it just looks like dinnerware that you'd get anywhere else. Just white, it's plain. But it's like, but the description, the copywriter they have is good. I mean, it, how they talk about how that's one of the things, you know, to increase the value. There's all kinds of, you know, behavioral science behind this. You talk about how the product is made and why it's different and the different benefits. And so, and I was telling my husband, he's like, no, you are not spending that much money on dinnerware because you can get it on weight, <laughs> you know, because it's not like we're serving. You got hooked. You got hooked. <laughs> I got him a uh, a fry pan for um, his birthday because he's been getting into cooking. And he, he looked on the website mm. and he goes, wow, do you see the prices in some of these things? And it was $150 for this pan. And he he said, yeah, some of these are 150 bucks. I said, what do you think I paid for that? He goes, what? <laughs> but now he treats it like, it's, you know, I mean, he really takes That's care right. of it. So I don't know. To me, it's like you have to, if you show the value, then people won't really question it. So, but yeah. Right. And, one and I think thing even with the pricing, I think for founders is maybe start out with the starting at price. I think that would be extremely helpful and a step in the right direction because I know marketers are all about it. It, it really comes down to the founder uh, or CEO of the company that is very hesitant about it. Mm -hmm. See, I had someone ask me that exact question the other day. They said, what do you think about saying starting at? And I don't know if I have that on my site. I don't think I do. But um, To step I, in the right direction is better than nothing, is my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I think so too. I don't know why this person was saying they didn't think it was a good idea. I guess it's like, well, why are you going to charge me more than if it's starting out? But then that gives you a chance to open up a discussion to what you offer too, right? Right. And for example, we, we have it on our website for just redesigns. We do have pricing plans for other services like a website retainer that has maintenance and web dev hours. But uh, when it comes to redesigns, we say starting at 20K and we know we're not a good fit for a lot of people. So that's part of the filtering system, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, when a company is ready to do a redesign, what are the things that they need to consider? So the first thing that most people do whenever they're ready for a redesign, whether that's the founder or the marketer, is they start asking their peers for a list of recommendations. Um, they'll start Google searching. They'll start looking at review sites like G2, Clutch, Google reviews, they'll start doing a ton of research, right? And they'll start filling out inquiry forms and everything. And then they start getting quotes for what a redesign 
some will get, okay, there's this one said 10, this one's 20, this one said 50, this one said 150, this one said 2K. You're getting quotes all over the map, right? And then you start narrowing down. Let's go to a second round interview <laughs> or let's, let's see which one we like the most. That's all a waste of time, in my opinion. I think what's really needed is not pulling a trigger on the redesign costs. I think it's two things that you can do. You can talk to somebody that has the expertise for RFPs. You know, they're an agency vetter. They know exactly how to talk between um, the client and the agency. And they're in between and they make the perfect match for them. It's like dating. So I think that is wise. And I wish I had that as a marketer. I have a friend that does it and she does an amazing job with it. And I highly recommend going to somebody that um, can actually do it. Her name's Ashley. But, and if anyone who's listening to this needs somebody with that expertise, it saves you a ton of headaches. It's, it takes you a ton of time. Yeah. Um, because you, you don't want to get a bad fit that doesn't align with right. your guys' goals, values, all of that. So keep that in mind. And everyone says they can do everything under the sun. So you have to be very wise in who to choose. But another thing I would also add too is doing a website audit. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you don't need a redesign. A lot of times you just have issues that need to be fixed. And it costs way less than doing a redesign. But you wouldn't know if you didn't do a website audit. Do you do those? We Web do website audits. Okay. And because we inherit websites from a previous developer that built the website, it's like me inheriting a house. And it's like, yeah, go figure out where the gas pipe is and the toilet and the water meter and all this other stuff. And, and I'm like, Great. Where's the emergency shutoff? Like <laughs> in case something happens, <laughs> like it, it, all these issues start piling up. But before I dive in and, or before I say, let's just trash it, let's just do a redesign. It's much cleaner and everything, which a lot of people do. A lot of marketers do that. Let me, let me look into it a little bit. Let's do a website audit. And our website audit is different. Some people do a website audit. They're like, hey, we can improve your conversion rate by this percent and we can do this and improve the user experience. That's great, but they don't have the expertise to actually go to the back end and expose vulnerabilities, expose issues. It's like, can we look at the engine of the car, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we're just fixing the door and we're just fixing the color paint. The aesthetics. But if the engine isn't going to take us from point A to point B, what's, why is it worth paying for this coat of paint and right. to fix the door, which is all exterior stuff. So we focus on the engine, which is the back end. We log in to your website that we're going to inherit. Mm -hmm. And I strongly always recommend a website audit if we're inheriting the website. Because you get to see what the previous developer built. You get mm -hmm. to see all your issues. You get to see what needs to be updated from a security standpoint, but also from a plugin, a theme standpoint too, um, a hosting standpoint. And we provide a detailed list of recommendations, how many hours each task will take to fix the issues mm -hmm. that we found. We provide recommendations about how to improve your website performance, how to make your website a lot faster for use, usability, accessibility, user experience, SEO, all that stuff from a technical standpoint. So we break all that down and we also provide a recommendation as an option for a redesign because you get to compare like, oh, it actually makes sense to do the redesign because if we fix all these issues, we still have a dated theme, a dated website that is just, we're gonna have to do a redesign eventually even if we fix these issues. Right. But the main and the main reason why I I strongly recommend the website audit is you want to know what you're paying for and why you're paying for it. Right. The last thing I want people to do is be like, "Hey, I trust you. I feel like I know you. I see your LinkedIn content. Your videos are awesome. You're right. 
You know, I need a website maintenance plan. Sign me up. We already have a list of issues. And you know what? If you recommend a redesign, I trust you because remember, man, I know you. And I'm like, that's the last thing you want to do with me. Okay. Not that I'm a bad person, but that's the last thing you want to do. You want to do a website audit and you want to know, it doesn't matter if you have trust with the agency person or not. You want to make sure you know exactly what your issues are and why you're paying for it. Right. A lot of people don't know. It's all based off trust and like, and that's it. Yeah. It's almost like a value proposition for me when people say they want a new cop. They want all their copy redone. And so my audit is, let me take a right. look at your foundational messaging. Because if that's not making sense, everything built on that is not going to make sense and eventually just not work. So right. yeah, and I, I would think with what you do, somebody like me who's very artsy, you know, I'd be like, I just want it to look better and I want it. And everything would be about the appearance and and you would be the one to say, all right, let's look at how it's actually performing. And because it doesn't matter what it looks right. like. And I've seen some crazy websites, especially I don't yeah. know how writers have like these websites that are super fun. And, but I have no idea what they even do. I mean, just things rolling around and things changing shape and size. And that doesn't matter if they can't get to where they want to get to. So I've seen crazy nightmare stories. We have a, a new client and I said, Hey, I think we should do a website audit and then we should think about if we need to do a redesign or not. Jesus, this is what they said. Jesus, we're not going to do a redesign. We just paid for a redesign. I'm like, oh, crap. This is not good. I hope you guys didn't pay a lot for it because we're, d- we're going to be hanging out in the, in, in the, in the garbage can for a little <laughs> bit here. <laughs> this, is, this is all tangled wires. This is a lot of stuff. And they came to us. Our website goes down. We don't know why. Certain pages go down. We don't know why. Past events are showing up on our website. We don't know why. Wow. Yeah. It's a lot of issues. They don't know why. And I said, okay, I won't put a redesign as an option. I'm going to list out all the issues. First month of the retainer hours are going to go straight to their website audit issues, which is a whole list. I Probably like seven, eight pages of issues that we found. Wow. A lot yeah. of bad code. And people don't know. And there's so many people that do what you do, just like with my business. You know, it's yeah. so it's hard to just figure out who to trust. And and that's why it's it's good that you, you know, kind of this is how it's gonna work. <laughs> We're gonna first look at what's wrong. You have to kind of, you know, set the tone. But I well, love is, talking about this topic. Yeah. We're gonna have to do another one. This is really good. <laughs> this is part one. <laughs> This is part one. You got me really going with that website audit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll do a whole other episode just on that because that's interesting in itself. So, But our time is up for today and this has been awesome and it's great just catching up to everything. So where can people find you and your uh, company? I'll put everything in the show notes. Yes. Find me on LinkedIn, Jesus McDonald. I post pretty much about WordPress websites. That's all my content that's about. I talk about website tips, uh, security tips. I talk about how to improve conversions. I talk about things you should know, red flags, you name it. Um, I try to do that on weekdays and my posting times vary. <laughs> so <laughs> I got, I got to YouTube. figure out a time. You have a lot of, I'm on YouTube. YouTube you can short. check our YouTube channels. We have YouTube shorts there too. Um, and are you TikTok still on TikTok as well? Are you? Okay. Yes, but we really are pushing a lot of the content on YouTube and LinkedIn. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again for taking time. This has been a lot of fun as always. And uh, thanks for being on.